The forecourt is probably the most recognised building in Ireland, uh, whether it's from TV news reports, uh, court reports, back of bank notes, the front of car or matchboxes. Um, in fact, it's so ubiquitous that most of us probably don't really look at it. I remember even as a kid looking at the back of the £20 note. It's such a beautiful drawing because it's the original drawing. The Four Courts was built between 1786 and 1802, so it took 16 years to put the place together. And it was designed by the leading English-born architect uh, of his time working in Ireland, uh, James Gandon, who came to the city about five years previously in 1781 to design the Custom House. He caused a lot of upset at the fact that he slowly began to suck in all the plum jobs, all the major commissions. Most of the buildings that we now know in the city from the Custom House, Four Courts, the King's Inns, alterations to the Rotunda Hospital, uh, the House of Lords Portico, College Street, you name it, he was devouring these projects. If Gandon thought he had a challenging brief at the Custom House, well, he was in for a shock when it came to the Four Courts. He had, I suppose, three major things to grapple with. Number one, the site was very shallow. He had to incorporate a major semi-finished public building designed by another architect, Thomas Cooley, the public record office located at the western side of the site. And then thirdly, this was the only site in the entire Liffey scape that was sited right on the bend in the river, which meant that the main palace front of the building would be out of view in the eastern, more commercial part of the city. There's often been discussion about what precedent influenced Gandon in the Four Courts, the concept. Of course, he would have been familiar with St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where he grew up. He would have seen drawings of the new Pantheon and what became the Pantheon in Paris. But I suppose ultimately the spirit of the Four Courts and probably what influenced Gandon most of all is this romantic idea that Piranesi captured in his engravings and drawings and paintings throughout the 18th century of former civilizations, of ruined buildings and landscapes. In the Four Courts we have this monumental drum which is shrouded in neoclassical finery, so there's an elegance to it. But its rawness, the monumentality of it, and the shallow saucer dome, it's not a full hemisphere as we're used to in, in European domes, so it evokes an ancient civilization, and there's a, a poeticness to it. And that kind of delicious contrast between that neoclassical finery and the robustness of that, from a distance, creates the most perfect silhouette. It's monumental, it's raw, and it's instantly memorable. Another beautiful feature of the front elevation of the building is the apse that's positioned right behind the portico. So when you go in behind the pillars, you're in another semi-curved space before you actually enter into the building itself. He curved uh, the back wall uh, of the portico, which gives a, a beautiful entrance sequence as you're entering into the building and the great rotunda hall in the centre of the Four Courts is only made great by the fact that the vestibule that you walk through to get into it is small. It conditions you from the great expanse of the outdoors as you walk through into the portico, into this small space, and then bam! It's a railway station. It's a railway station 50 years before its time. It's a great public milling space. It's hard for, from the modern sensibility to think that all of the courtrooms originally communicated directly with the Great Hall. So the grand columnar screens that frame each of the entrances to the courtrooms effectively framed the access points. These were later shrouded by curtains and now they're framed by solid walls. But originally it was much more Roman uh, in inspiration. So the courts communicated uh, with the public realm of the Great Rotunda and the Rotunda itself was sunken lower than the courts. So there was an elegant ascent of steps up to each of the courtrooms. The four courts were the four principal courts in the late 18th century. King's Bench, Common Pleas, Chancery and Exchequer. And Gandon incorporated these like the segments of an orange within the main block of the four courts. We also forget this was a secular building. You know, it wasn't an ecclesiastical building. 
Well, this is a temple to the Irish judiciary to make a statement in the heart of the city. The bombardment in 1922 had really a devastating impact on the building. Not only had most of the western arm of the building been exploded out, but the sheer array of bullet spray across the front of the building caused huge damage. The fire that effectively consumed most of its contents had a huge impact on the fabric of the stonework and the iron clamps that were holding the building together. We really have the principal architect of the OPW, TJ Byrne, to thank for persuading uh, W.T. Gosgrave that the building could be saved. Well, I suppose TJ Byrne would be a hero of mine, and he's a hero of a lot of architects in OPW because he, he was very, very cognizant of his role also and you'd have to remember at that time in the 1920s to take a particular stance on something is a very dangerous thing to do. He felt that it was important to preserve this building and to actually engage with how you would get it to struggle on into some sort of continuity into a new Ireland. He felt strongly enough about it to actually stand up for it as a piece of architecture. T.J. Byrne employed the, the new technology of the day was to use cement rather than lime. Probably the largest concrete pour ever undertaken in Ireland to cast the dome uh, approximately within the silhouette of Gandon's original. Unfortunately, the consequences of that is that many of the ferrous metals that were embedded in that to reinforce the concrete have uh, been subject to water ingress and to deterioration. This building is two centuries old. It needs care. It is a really robust, strong, well-built building, but it has had some big shocks in its life. A hundred years ago, the building was shelled and then gutted by fire. A lot of the stone was replaced, but the stone capitals were retained. Damaged parts were put facing into the drum and the parts that were okay were facing out towards the public. They have really taken a battering from the fire and the shelling and they've also had the weather damage over the last hundred years. We needed to find the right skilled masons to recreate those capitals. The biggest challenge of putting the new capitals in was to get them up to the top of the dome. We had the stone capitals driven up early in the morning before the court service started, brought in through the front door, up through the ceiling, through the existing opening in the ceiling, wheeled over to one of the windows that was taken out of the drum, up the scaffolding to the top of the column, and then very carefully manoeuvred to the top of the column, a bit like a surgeon. Remnants of a blue sky were found on the inner face of the concrete capping. As part of the repairs, um, there was some remedial works done uh, to the dome and then the night sky was reinstated. It's always fantastic when you uh, come across a little piece of the history that has been forgotten and when you uh, dig a little deeper, do a bit of research, uh, it, it re-emerges. One of the most exciting parts of the project has been the opportunity to work with the original drawings. The drawings that Gandon's team would have created. So there's this straight line all the way back, which connects us all. I have access to his drawings. I can look at the people who worked for him. I can see their actual, line, actual lines on a page. And that is a language, it's like a symphony. When I look at the drawings, when I look at James Gandon's drawings, when anybody looks at them, that is an international language. It's plan, it's section, it's elevation, there are measurements on it, and they're as valid today as the day the person sat there with the quail or whatever. They have left a legacy for us. They also have left their thoughts and dreams about how the building would be constructed. It's really important to point out that this building is a survivor. We're passing it every day. It survived the adversary of, of the Civil War, and is still serving the original function for which it was built. There's such potential in the setting of the four courts, and indeed the entire length of the Liffey, 
give it back to people, to have a public promenade in a way that allows us to take a breather, to actually stop and admire the setting and the legacy and the inheritance of the 18th century city. But honestly, the Four Courts has it. It just has it in spades. <laughs>